Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Thierry Aris here, uh, and this is another episode of the AIER Basti Society Switzerland. This time we have the honor of having Matthias de Smet. Matthias, thank you very much for being with us. You're welcome. I'm, it's, I'm glad to be here. So, so Matthias, uh, to really move uh, straight on to the topic of the day, uh, we're going to explore first a little bit of your background to, for people to know who you are uh, and where you're coming from, but then also uh, explore the topic of uh, mass formation. Um, so can you tell us uh, first a little bit about where you're coming from and what's your background? Yes, I'm a professor in clinical psychology at uh, Ghent University. And uh, I also long ago got a uh, master degree in statistics. Um, I'm, I don't call myself a statistician because for me a statistician is someone who uh, is involved in statistical research day in, day out, and that's no longer the case with me. Uh, that has been the case in the beginning of my career, but uh, in the first five years, maybe five or six years, but not anymore now. But so, um, uh, I also have a clinical practice as a psychotherapist. Um, so that is about what I uh, do in life. Um, so, so talking about the pandemic, uh, I, I heard you said before that you started with an approach where you were looking at the statistics, when you were looking at the data, and then you figured out that uh, it, it was something more than that. Can, can you take us through what, what yes. your approach yes. was? Yes, well, from the beginning of the corona crisis, I rather took a skeptical stance. I think that's good to mention, and I, I just started to study the, the figures and the, 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 the graphs and, the, and all the statistics used and also the mathematical models that uh, were used to uh, predict um, the course of the of the pandemic and i noticed time and time again in the beginning that in my opinion uh, or, or that it seemed to me that uh, the statistics and the figures overrated even dramatically overrated uh, the dangerousness of the virus um, and um, something else that i noticed from the beginning was that it seemed to me that um, in one way or another, both the experts and a major part of the population seem to be neglecting or ignoring a major part of reality. For instance, it seemed to me that everybody was focused on the danger of the, or the, the damage that the virus could claim, the victims the virus could claim, but in a strange way, people seem to be insensitive or they seem to neglect uh, the damage the measures could claim, the so-called collateral damage. So those were the two things that in the beginning I could go much more in, into detail about that, but maybe it's better not to do so because we can use our time maybe better to, to discuss the phenomenon of mass formation itself that, that is maybe more important. But so, so, so tell us uh, how, how you, what is mass formation and how do you get to to yes. Sideways. Well, yes, I, st I started from, so, I, the, the, so first in the, in the first months of the crisis until May 2020, I think, I just studied the statistics and the numbers and I noticed time and time again the two phenomena that I, that I have been describing, that I have just been describing, namely people had showed a tendency to dramatically overrate the dangerousness of the virus and then also to neglect the collateral damage caused by the measure switch which led to the strange situation in which scientists warned us time and time again, or at least some did, that uh, uh, the, the measures might um, uh, cause much more casualties than the virus would do. Uh, and nevertheless, we never in the mainstream media at any time did we see a proper cost-benefit analysis uh, in the mainstream media. So in one way or another, society seemed to be blind for uh, uh, the collateral damage of the measures. So, and that was the moment, by the end of May 2020, I really started to think about what was going on at the psychological level in society that could explain how it was possible that society seemed to be in the grip of a, of a process in which um, uh, they constantly over uh, exagger uh, overestimated uh, the dangerousness of the virus and at the same time neglect, uh, neglected uh, uh, the collateral so, so, so how do you get there from a moment on the pre-pandemic to the moment of, uh, of, of blind sightness? 
Yes. So is there any specific process what, that, that you go yes. through? What happens there? So, when in, in August 2020, it became, or at least, uh, uh, it became clear to me, I think, that what was going on was a large scale process of what we call mass formation. And mass formation happens when very specific conditions were met. And these conditions were fulfilled just before the Corona crisis. You know, the first of these conditions is that there should be a lot of people experiencing a lack of social bond. Many people should feel socially isolated. And if you look, for instance, at what the Surgeon General, the US Surgeon General said, you see that they mentioned that there was a loneliness epidemic. At least 50% of the people reported that they had no meaningful relationships at all and that the only way the only way in which they connected to other people was through the internet, which is absolutely not the same as a connection in, in real life. So to give only one example, to give a second example, uh, Theresa May appointed a minister of loneliness. Uh, I, I believe that it was, yes, I believe that it was somewhere in 2017 because she acknowledged that uh, there were huge portions of the population who suffered from pathological or at least severe uh, social isolation. Um, so that's the first condition. In order for mass formation to emerge, you need these, uh, you, there must be a lot of people in society who feel socially isolated. Then the second condition, a lot of people should experience a lack of meaning making and sense making in life. And it's also, also very easy to illustrate that. Also, this was the case just before the Corona crisis. If you read, for instance, the book of David Graeber, uh, bullshit jobs, then you will see that at least 40%, according to Graeber, of the people experience their job as completely meaningless and senseless. And if you look at a world poll, a Gallup world poll uh, of uh, 2016, I believe, uh, then uh, this, this world poll found that upon being asked whether or not they considered their job as meaningful, only 13, 13% of the people answered yes. And 60% answered in a convinced way, no. So, uh, it is, I think this illustrates that also the second condition was definitely met just before the Corona crisis. And then the third condition is that there should be a lot of people experien experiencing a lack, uh, uh, high levels of what we call free floating anxiety. That means anxiety that is not connected to a mental representation or to an object. So anxiety in which the subject, the person who feels it, doesn't know what he is anxious for. In contrast with, for instance, uh, uh, anxiety for a, a dangerous dog or a dangerous animal or no matter what is dangerous, but in which situation the, pe the person does know what he's anxious for. And this free-floating anxiety, this free-floating anxiety is much more painful and much more aversive uh, than the anxiety that is coupled to representation, simply because if you are anxious without knowing what you're anxious for, then it's very hard to control your anxiety because you cannot think of a strategy to escape the object of anxiety if you don't know it. Mm. But then there is a fourth condition, a lot of free-floating frustration and aggression, which is a in the same vein, a kind of a type of aggression and frustration which you cannot couple to a certain object. So you are aggressive, you feel aggressive and frustrated, but you don't know why. And these four conditions are logically connected to each other. If people feel a lack of social bond, if they feel socially isolated, being human beings, they will probably also feel a lack of meaning making. And consequently, if people feel lack of social bond, if they feel socially isolated and they feel a lack of meaning making, they will be confronted typically with this free floating anxiety. They will be anxious, but they will not know why. And if you're socially isolated, experience a lack of meaning making and uh, anxiety, you're in a very aversive mental state and you will get frustrated and aggressive without being able to blame someone or without being able to say what you're frustrated and aggressive for. And uh, if and now it happens, so these conditions were definitely met before the corona crisis, and then 
if under such conditions a narrative is distributed through the mass media indicating an object of anxiety such as a virus for instance and at the same time providing a strategy to deal with the object of anxiety then there might be a huge willingness in the population to participate in in this strategy to deal with the object of anxiety so what will happen is that all this freely floating anxiety will connect will be attributed will 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 be connected to this mental representation of the object of anxiety and people will adopt or will participate in a strategy that is provided to deal with this object of anxiety for instance the lockdowns the social distancing and so on and in that way a first psychological avant advantage is obtained namely all the free floating anxiety is now connected to an object and can be mentally controlled and then something even more important happens because many people participate in the object of uh, in the in the struggle in the in the in the strategy to deal with the object of anxiety a new kind of social bond emerges a new solidarity a new collective emerges so the collective that was fragmented and um, uh, destroyed is re-emerges through the heroic battle with the object of anxiety so a new kind of social bond emerges which is which has very special characteristics because it is a bond of all the individual subjects with the collective not it's not a social bond between the individuals it's a new social bond in which everybody identifies with the collective so that's what's happening and this leads to that's what we call the emergence of a mass or a crowd mm. and so, then, so the mass formation is basically uh, these basically people who are somewhat uh, lost and they decide to adhere to the narrative and then you have a self-fulfilling or self-reinforcing narrative uh, with mental intoxication that you you, you were discussing about exactly exactly there's a there's a fourth step first because once the masses emerge there is always a group or there are there are always certain people who don't want to go along with the narrative and who don't want to buy into the narrative and mm, okay. as a consequence who are excluded from the masses and those are the people who become the new enemy and this fourth condition all this free floating anxiety and frustration the masses always show the tendency to direct all their frustration and aggression towards this the group who doesn't go along with the, with the crowd. And mm. if this happens, then you see that suddenly a major part of the population switches from a highly negative and aversive mental state of social isolation, lack of meaning making, free floating anxiety, free floating frustration and aggression, they shift to the up to a symptomatic a symptomatically positive mental state in which they feel connected again in which they feel that they belong to a collective again in which they feel a new kind of meaning making in the struggle with the with the with the object of anxiety in which their anxiety is all connected to a representation and hence controllable and in which all the frustration and aggression can be satisfied and can be directed at an object and that leads indeed to a certain mental intoxication it leads to a mental intoxication to a extremely narrow focusing of the attention on one small aspect of reality in this case the virus and the struggle with the virus which is perfectly similar or perfect or, or which resembles or which is even identical to what happens in a process of hypnosis mm. mass formation was often is often called by the major scholars who studied it a group hypnosis because yeah, okay. in hypnosis just like in mass formation all the attention is in the grip of one specific aspect of reality and all the rest disappears from the field of attention disappears into the darkness and for all the rest people seem to be both cognitively and emotionally blind and 
that happens really to an extreme extent. For instance, if someone, doctors in hospitals, when someone is allergic to anesthesia, to chemical or biochemical anesthesia, sometimes use a simple hypnotic procedure to make someone insensitive to pain. And so the only thing the hypnotist or the doctor hypnotist has to do in that case is focusing the attention through a, through a hypnotic procedure on one, usually a positive aspect of reality. And after a while, it doesn't take too long, the surgeon can start to cut straight through the skin, the flesh, even the breastbone, the bones of the, of the patient, and the patient won't notice it. That means that, and, and this process also happens in, in a process of mass formation. And that's why, in the current situation, many people don't seem to be aware that they are losing everything that they are, that was important to them. So yeah, the, amount of, the amount of sacrifice that people um, are willing to put up with, including losing their jobs and something that is fundamental to almost leaving, uh, is really, is really, uh, is really mind boggling because you, you would think, well, would you, it's almost like in certain cases, in certain areas of the world, it's almost like you're going to die anyways, but you're going to die from something else. So, yes, <coughs> yeah. yes, definitely. It's my so, okay, so, it's, so, it's so, baffling, so, yes. So, so Matthias, I'm, I'm just trying to go through the different steps from a clinical standpoint and try to identify, because then I have a, 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 a big question as to how do you deal with that problem, right? So just, just try to, try, try to, to, uh, to summarize what you just said. There is a certain number of preconditions for, for, ma for mass formation, and that is the social isolation, uh, the lack of sense making, the high level of free floating anxiety, the high level of free floating uh, frustrating and aggressiveness that you cannot really pinpoint or target, right? And mm -hmm. then once those preconditions are met, you can manipulate the masses by pointing at an object of anxiety that would be the, 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 the thing that is wrong. And then you make it fit all of the, uh, all of the buckets. Basically, the social isolation would be justified by that, uh, by that object of anxiety. The lack of sense making will be because you are adhering to the strategy uh, that is provided by the narrative and then the high level of free coding anxiety and the frustration and aggressiveness will be somewhat used to basically punish the dissidents that do not fit within the narrative and so within that realm you end up with a society that was kind of lost and now has some sort of meaning that is provided by by the narrative and so therefore you have a reinforcing process uh, because I, I, uh, I'm part of Mensa, uh, and uh, the, the, one, of, uh, one of the members is actually um, a, a hypnotherapist. So I am a, a little bit um, uh, familiar with, uh, uh, you know, uh, hypnotic uh, 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 practices and, uh, you know, uh, ailment uh, inductions and things like that. At some point in the induction, there is a process called deepening, and that deepening is essentially reinforcing uh, the idea precisely like you said to narrow the scope of focus so that nothing else matters and one of the things you've mentioned uh, previously is the people even though it seems like it's very individualistic they actually give away some fundamental rights some fundamental freedoms and there's nothing egoistic about it because precisely it's like the ego is transcended to the to the to the collective and the collective is actually not the collective because you you only follow the narrative and so whatever the narrative tells you is uh, the collective then that will be the collective in this way in this way the collective will be we have to protect uh, the people sick but only if they're sick from covid and we have to protect people from dying or suffering but only if it is from covid Whereas if it is from some any other reason, 
Mm -hmm. uh, then then this doesn't matter. So it's really, it, I, I agree with when you say it really does look like an induction. Uh, and so and so there is there's two big questions, right? The first one is how did you come out of the induction, uh, which is uh, usually uh, in, in, a for, in, in another podcast, you say it's basically a realization and a waking up. And sometimes it's much it's much harder psychologically to face reality rather than, than stay in, in the dream state, right? Uh, that's one. And then the second thing is, how can you, uh, I, I'm thinking uh, as, as, a, as a mass uh, study, how can you redirect the object of anxiety from being uh, the, the, the COVID sickness into the loss of freedom? In other words, perhaps the loss of freedom and fundamental rights is an object of anxiety that could be much larger than the actual numbers of of of, of COVID uh, casualties, which are you know uh, which are tragic, but proportionately are mm -hmm. are relatively uh, uh, low. You know? Yeah. Good questions, and uh, I think so, the so answer. The first one is: Do you think it's harder to wake up people, or do you think it's it's harder to to point out that another object of anxiety? I think it's harder to wake them up. Um, yeah. Yes, but let me try to answer. Your first question as well. So you said like once people are in this state, uh, when when these four conditions are fulfilled, they can be easily manipulated. Mm -hmm. That's true, uh, but it remains the question: to what extent the process of mass formation is intentionally induced, is intentionally provoked, or emerges in a spontaneous way? Because if you look at if you look at Gustave Le Bon and uh, McDougall Conetti, they have all stressed that uh, there is one difference between mass formation and classical hypnosis. It's very similar, but there is one important difference as well, and it is that the leaders of the masses usually are also in the hypnosis. They are also okay. hypnotized. Uh -huh. so, so it's and, mass hysteria in a way. Well, well, it, it, that, and it's good because also that the, it's, it's often, it's good to, to wonder at what level do we have to situate this uh, hypnosis of the leaders. Mm -hmm. For instance, usually the leaders believe are hypnotized by their own ideology, Gustave Le Bon said. Yeah. In this yeah, way that, that what we actually see now throughout the last two or three decades is that in the confrontation with objects of anxiety, for instance, terrorism or uh, the coronavirus or uh, climate change, or climate change. Yes, uh, that's also a good example. People seem more and more to believe or, or more and more people seem to believe that the only solution to the problems we are facing or we are confronted with is a technocratic solution or even a transhumanist solution. And so, in other words, they believe that we need uh, a transhumanist or a technocratic ideology to solve the problems we are facing. So we need some angels to come in and tell us basically what to do. Yes, experts. We need experts who tell us what to do. And we cannot, if we continue if a democratic system can never find a solution for the dramatic problems we are facing, more and more people are convinced of that. And that's the level of the ideology, I think. And I do believe, I do believe that the people who step forward now and who uh, try to lead the masses, who provide the narrative also that is hypnotizing the masses, that they truly believe themselves in this ideology. They are convinced. Yeah. So, so it's a, it's a very good point because one of, one of the things we are looking at at the AIER in particular is is the effect of the state uh, in uh, in the propaganda machine, right? Um, 
there, there is not only a communication propaganda on one way, but there's also a restriction on the legal side, which is becoming very worrisome right now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and so what, what, one of the things uh, I tend to believe is, you know, because, you know, I'm a free market uh, uh, libertarian, right? So I believe in civil liberties, but I also believe in economic liberty. And, 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 and a, big, uh, a big part of this is we believe fundamentally that the market, meaning the, the collective consciousness, if you want the hand of God or Adam Smith, whatever you want to call it, is much uh, stronger and, and rightful than, uh, than the, the big central planners, right? And, and this is the, the basis of uh, capitalism versus socialism. Uh, so so I, I, I think you, 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 you kind of pinned into the answer of uh, a lot of conspiracy theories that believe that you know, it is all planned by a Machiavellic super brain. Uh, I personally don't believe they're smart enough to do that, right? No. I, I think I think I think a little bit like the 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 the, the reason of the why is is not so much that they are master planners, but that they themselves are hypnotized into their into their into this into this ideological belief, regardless of of how wrong that ideology is, and that's, this is usually that's... what you see in extremists. Uh, on the left, on the right, it doesn't matter. Uh, I, I, idealists uh, are much more dangerous in a way than what people call Machiavellian people, right? Like you would take the example of of, of, of Adolf Hitler, who who is an idealist. He would not compromise his ideals versus somebody uh, uh, like uh, like perhaps uh, um, in Italy. Uh, was uh, was Mussolini. more of a Mussolini, who was more of a mercenary. Whoever whoever gives him what he wants most, he would he would just change a little bit. So mm-hmm. I, I do believe that it really is this this uh, the, the mass formation enables uh, and is plugged into an ideal. So again, yeah. like the, the question here is how far can you go? Because the the hypnosis. Uh, from for, from what I have seen, and particularly if there's deepeners, it starts with with one one side, but it can go very very far as much as as irreparable damage. I mean, you can basically decide to give away. I think there's a lot of masochistic uh, uh, behaviors and patterns uh, by basically foregoing completely your rights uh, for the sake of the greater cause. And I see this for the virus. I see this for the idealists on the on the climate change. Because if you push the narrative of the climate change to the to the end, it basically says the population is too big. We should all make an effort and you know give a give away a couple of people. But you know who's going to decide uh, mm-hmm. who is who is it to die or not? When it, when you lo- really look at the narrative and you push it to the extreme, it looks like there's a masochistic pattern as to uh, making people uh, towards some sort of sacrifice. And so y- almost like human sacrifice is good. I've even seen articles saying COVID is wonderful for climate change because if it really goes through, maybe a lot of people are going to die and then we will be much better off. I mean, it's pretty psychotic to be thinking like that, don't you think? I don't know if it is psychotic, could be. But, um, um, well, there is definitely something dehumanizing in it. That's true. (laughs) And, um, you know, I think it's extremely important to distinguish between the ideology in a process of mass formation and also in a process of totalitarian thinking, because that's actually very similar. Uh, Totalitarian states always are based on mass formation, and that is what distinguishes them of classical dictatorships. Actually, a classical dictatorship is is, is completely different, is radically different from a totalitarian state. Um, But we have to distinguish between the role played by ideology in a process of mass formation and the role played by the narrative, because that's something different. I I do believe that 
the leaders of the masses and the large institutes, social institutes, global institutes, who try to lead the masses, I do believe that the leaders of the masses almost always um, uh, deeply believe, fanatically believe in the ideology they represent, the transhumanist ideology, the technocratic ideology, and so on. Because Gustave Le Bon and uh, McDougall, I believe, uh, both stressed that if the leaders do not believe in their ideology, they can never have this hypnotizing impact on the masses. Mm. But usually, in a strange way, because the leaders fanatically believe in their ideology, they also believe that it is justified to mislead, to manipulate the masses. Because they the end justifies the means. Yes, of course. The end justifies the means. Be exactly because they are so convinced that their ideology will create the best possible society and the best possible future for humanity that they consider it justified to manipulate, lead, uh, lie, cheat a little bit, even sometimes very much, just indeed because they feel that in the end every, everything will be um, uh, well, much better off. I mean, yes, uh, they will be much better off. Right. And so that means that the leaders usually fanatically believe, I, I, I was thinking about the word compensated, so, so, so uh, uh, in the end the, the, the fruits of the, of, 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 the, of the process will compensate for all the suffering. And <laughs> Yes, and so, so the leaders of the masses are usually characterized by a, a strong and fanatic belief in the ideology and a, a radical lack of belief in their own narratives. So I think so, that's... Yeah. So those who are the most mentally intoxicated are actually at the leadership of all and, of and, and waking them up given, the, you know, given that the stereotype uh, archetype of people that would just... Uh, be inclined to take responsibility and leadership usually comes with a lot of ego. So that is also reinforced in some way mm. that they cannot really stop uh, being the leader and, 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 and like remove themselves from maybe I am wrong, right? Because mm. that is not a question. It's got to be decisive. Um, so it feels to me that any sort of leadership that could have that power, regardless of whatever bandwidth it is, becomes fundamentally dangerous because I'm, I'm, I'm usually taking the example of Lee Kuan Yew in Singapore, which is a leader that I admire the most. But one of the problems and one of the reasons why I'm in Switzerland is because that type of strong leadership is very good whenever the leader is good, but the system can turn in its head whenever the leader becomes bad or is corrupted because the concentration of power then can flip things around. So I'd rather have more decentralization uh, and more individual freedom to have a collective uh, by the sum of, all, of it all, rather than concentrating the powers uh, into, into one leadership. Uh, so what do you feel like, in order to try to end uh, this sort of conversation, is what do you feel uh, if you take this and maybe downscale it to the individual level, uh, is the process to come out of this situation? Uh, because yeah. empathy is a big is a big part of it. I, I don't feel like confrontation uh, will help. It feels like confrontation is more polarizing rather than rather than uh, uh, harmonizing. So, what what is the, what is the normal process to come out of this? Well. There definitely need to be people who defy the masses and who, who, who resist to go along with the masses. Um, and uh, they must act uh, according to the principles of nonviolent resistance. That's for sure. Uh, many people who have been studying totalitarianism and, and the related phenomenon of mass formation have remarked that in one way or another, without really understanding it, uh, non-violent resistance usually is the most effective resistance against emerging totalitarianism. Uh, Hannah Arendt, before, uh, for instance, has described that. Uh, and, and 
you can psychologically understand why nonviolent resistance is most effective, I think. It's simply because um, uh, when the masses are confronted with this minority that uses violence, they will always use that violence as a justification to commit atrocities and to destroy the minority. That's very clear. And the dynamics, in a, and for instance, a classical dictatorship are completely different. In a classical dictatorship, usually nonviolent resistance would not lead to anything at all. <laughs> but speaking in more general terms, I think the first and most important thing is that uh, the dissonant voices continue to speak out. People who do not agree have to continue to speak out. And that is because mass formation is, al is always, it shows the same characteristics. It's similar to hypnosis. And hypnosis is a phenomenon that is provoked and created and uh, by by uh, by the voice by the voice of someone uh, by the voice of a hypnotist and that's why totalitarian leaders know that every day has to has to start with half an hour of propaganda <laughs> because they know they know that it is the voice that keeps the, <laughs> the population and the in the in the in the, in the state of, of mass formation but, but you do see censorship uh, at that level also yeah so whenever there is dissidents you do you do see censorship I mean even myself when I'm uh, when I'm looking at articles, like peer-reviewed articles that, that I want to post, even those are sometimes censored. So it, it really it really becomes increasingly difficult to to still voice uh, of course uh, dissident opinion. Of course, and still we have to continue, I think, because uh, history clearly showed that it is at the moment that the dissonant voice is silenced or stops to speak out that. Uh, the the masses start to commit their absurd atrocities and that the totalitarian states go completely crazy. And that's also a, a, a sharp difference uh, with the classical dictatorships. When a classical dictator, dictator succeeded in silencing uh, the opposition in public space, he almost always become, mitigates, mitigates his aggression. He always, all, almost always becomes milder. And that's simply because he realizes that at that moment, he just has to uh, 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 show to the, to, the, to the population that he will be a good leader and, and that he, he wants to keep them, them uh, by, by, by mit mitigating his aggression, he can, to, he can keep the population quiet. So he shows, usually, the classical dictator shows, has enough common, common sense to know that it is in his own importance uh, that he mitigates his aggression once he is uh, uh, in charge. Uh, and that's, that common sense is exactly what is lacking to, uh, to, uh, to, to totalitarian leaders because they are so obsessed with their ideological uh, ideal image uh, of of of, uh, of how to reshape society uh, that they that it is exactly at that moment that uh, there is no opposition anymore or that the opposition is silenced that they become completely in the grip of their own uh, um, uh, ideology and of the, their own you know, madness actually uh, and it is exactly at that moment that they start to commit atrocities and that they start to, 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 to become aggressive in an absurd way. So um, that shows the importance that that happened around 1930 in the Soviet Union and around 1935 in, the, in Nazi Germany. At that moment, uh, the opposition was silenced. And at that moment, the system started to become uh, aggressive and destructive in an, in an absurd way. Uh, eliminate yeah, yeah, so, so, so in order to in order to wrap it up a little bit, what, what, what do you what do you think would be the recommendation uh, for everybody watching when it comes to uh, to you know uh, encouraging change, right? Because uh, it, it feels to me that keeping uh, keeping a critical mind is something that is really lacking at this moment. Uh, but then also trying to explain, for example, I have a couple of friends. And they were somewhat aggressive uh, towards me because I wasn't vaccinated, right? And uh, even though, by the way, even though I am medically exempt, I do actually have a reason for that. And mm. even then, the madness was so much so that I was still feeling pressure. And one of the solutions I found is to explain to them 
that they themselves were unvaccinated people at some point in the past, and that they themselves will be considered unvaccinated in the future, the way we're going through. Because in four months' time, they're also again unvaccinated. So, so how is it that you can, you know, make make other people understand and maybe sometimes come out of the hypnotic trance that that is being reinforced on an everyday basis? Yes, you know what you're describing there is the characteristic intolerance for dissonant voices. So uh, as soon as mass formation emerges, the masses become radically intolerant of dissonant voices. And that's actually, you can understand it in a very simple way. It's because the dissonant voices threaten to wake up the masses. And should they wake up, they would be confronted again with the painful psychological state they were in before the mass formation, namely the social isolation, this uh, lack of meaning making and so on. And at the same time, it's, there is a much easier solution for the masses than to wake up and be confronted with this painful state. It's just to use the dissonant voice as the object of aggression and frustration. And so that's that's at the psychological level more or less what happens. And um, uh, so, but nevertheless, that that shows that the, the the people who are not in a mass formation must continue to speak out, uh, to continue to 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 disturb the mass formation by uh, by uh, uh, um, uh, continuing to speak out and also they have to connect with each other that's extremely important because social isolation is the most basic problem that underlies um, uh, the, the mass formation so they must try to connect with each other uh, but also with, with with the people who well there are always three groups you always have a group who is really into the process of mass formation usually that group is not too big usually it is not much more than 30 percent of the population then there is a silent group who always goes along with the loudest voice in society who never goes against the current that's usually somewhere in between 40 to 60 percent and then there is a group who actively tries to resist by speaking out or doing something against uh, the mass formation or the totalitarian thinking and so this third group really has to continue to speak out on the one hand, to make the, the the process of mass formation less deep in the first group and to, to, to try to convince the second group to see that in the end, following the masses uh, uh, will lead to their own destruction. So, um, um, but it's extremely important when you speak out to do it in a sincere, polite and way to be sensitive uh, when people start to become uh, uh, aggressive or angry to always show a certain respect for the the the, uh, the opinion of the other, because it's never a good thing to to be completely uh, convinced that you're the only one who has something important to say, and so on. So you have to be you have to you have to speak in a, in an as sincere and as honest and as human way as possible. That's the most important thing, I believe, uh, uh, together with. Uh, the connection, we have to connect in the real world, uh, form a network, uh, parallel structure of mm. people who of people who have the feeling that there is something wrong. Uh, that's extremely important. And then, uh, well, maybe also something extremely important is that when you speak out, never try to convince people to go back to the old normal, because that's absurd, it makes no sense at all. The mass formation emerged because the old normal was terrible. So what it's much. It's a much better alternative to altogether try to construct a new normal. Uh, that is for an alternative, then. Yes, of course. The new normal. It's perfectly understandable that people want to escape uh, their bullshit jobs and their all their free floating anxiety, their frustration, aggression, their lack of their their social isolation. But the new normal doesn't ha doesn't have to be a new new normal in which people. Uh, or subjected to a social credit system, it doesn't have to be a technocratic or a transhumanist new normal. There are many other uh, uh, ways to to um, to um, to create a new normal, a new normal in which people can live a life worthy of a human being. <laughs> and that's yeah, that's, and, that's, a, and a normal maybe where the power goes back to the people, and precisely the opposite of going mm. into into a technocratic system. Yeah. All right, Matthias. So look. Like you said, it's it's very important to 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 remove yourself from the isolation, uh, to have physical contact, because like you said, the, 
there is much there is a silent minority uh, uh, and uh, sorry the silent majority that is that is actually uh, somewhat closer to reason than those who are uh, absolutely uh, fanatic and i think only by having a real physical and a normal uh, decent contact you can realize that the narrative that is pushed is much more extreme than the reality of what people think. Mm-hmm. I think that is very important to understand. And uh, and on that note, uh, whenever uh, all of this normalizes, uh, you're more than welcome to come uh, to Switzerland. Uh, I'm also a Belgian national, by the way. Oh. Um, uh, uh, my, my father is from the Flemish part. But uh, but yeah, uh, we, we, we can compare chocolates. Uh, whenever yes. we meet in person, and uh, yeah, that- I appreciate uh, you being here. Uh, I think there's a lot of value for our listeners, and I'm looking forward to uh, uh, speak to you again. Yes, thank you, Thierry, for inviting me. And I believe if we compare Belgium and Swiss chocolates, I hope we will win. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. But I, I, I can tell you that for the beer, that's that's a done deal already. Yes, so but the until, Swiss chocolates are, are wonderful. I, uh, yes. Uh, until next so, time. Uh, See you next time, Jerry. Bye bye. I'll be sharing some of your information. Uh, if you want to follow Matthias, uh, please like and share, and also uh, keep on informing yourself about uh, what is going on uh, on the economic side, but on, also on the psychological side. Uh, perhaps one of the solutions is to also speak more uh, as a person about your own problems uh, with professionals that can help you. And and uh, Matthias is in that profession, so. Perhaps that is also part of the solution uh, at a global scale. Until then, see you soon.